This training course will teach you about hydrogen sulfide, more commonly known as H2S. The course delivers essential information to prepare you for work in a high-risk environment. We'll go through the basics, then explain the dangers and exposure consequences, and teach you how to protect yourself while working in a hazardous area. Hydrogen sulfide is formed by the decay of organic matter which contains sulfur. It is commonly present near oil production sites such as drilling rigs, offshore wells and petroleum plants. If you are working near oil production or transport, you have the potential to be exposed to it. That is why you need to be adequately trained and familiar with the hazards of such environment. In order to understand what to do and how to protect yourself, the first thing you need to learn are the characteristics of H2S. It is colorless, meaning you can't see it. It stinks like rotten egg, which means your only way to sense it is by smelling it. It is heavier than air, so you may want to climb up if you smell it. Its weight makes it common to find in low-lying areas with poor ventilation. That is why it's also known as a sewer gas. And if all mentioned was not bad enough, H2S is highly flammable. To explain how flammable it is, first we need to understand what explosive range is. It is determined by the content of H2S in the air. The minimum concentration of H2S in the air required to ignite the fire is 4.3%. That is called lower explosive limit. The maximum concentration which will support ignition is 46%. That is called upper explosive limit. That range between lower and upper explosive limit is called explosive range. To get a better understanding of this, we can compare its explosive range with gasoline. By using this simple comparison, you can visualize the danger. As you can see, the range is much wider, which makes it more likely to combust. There is another characteristic of H2S already mentioned but needs a detailed explanation. It is a density of H2S, also known as vapor density. H2S is denser than air, making it heavier than air. That is a helpful fact to remember because it means H2S will go down when released, so you should move up when you hear the alarm. It is also a good practice to attach your gas detector as low as possible. For example, in the event of tank entry, where H2S is sitting on the bottom, your gas detector will alarm you in time, before you inhale the gas. Here are the key points you need to remember. H2S is deadly, flammable and explosive. It has no color, you can't see it. It stinks like rotten eggs, so at least you can detect it by the smell. It is heavier than air, which is also a characteristic we can use to our advantage. When it comes to exposure to H2S, you will easily be able to smell it. Even a minor amount of H2S in the air will produce a distinct smell of rotten eggs. Do not be deceived if the smell disappears. The cause for that may be the increase of H2S concentration above 100 ppm, which will disable your sense of smell. In that case, only a gas detector can warn you about the danger. There are different levels of exposure to H2S, categorized from harmless to lethal levels. If the concentration of H2S is less than 10 ppm, work in such environment is allowed for a limited time only. If H2S has reached 15 ppm, you should not be exposed to it longer than 15 minutes. At 20 ppm, the H2S concentration is too high, so you should not be in such area without a breathing apparatus. Exposure to more than 100 ppm could harm you immediately or damage your health permanently. You cannot enter such area unless you are wearing breathing apparatus and accompanied by a trained standby person. In simple words, less than 10 ppm is not scientifically proven to be dangerous and it is allowed to work in such area, although wearing a mask wouldn't hurt. 10 to 15 ppm is a serious concentration of gas. Do yourself a favor and get out of there as soon as possible. 15 to 20 ppm is dangerous, so you should get a breathing apparatus before entering such an area. 20 ppm and more can harm you depending on the quantity of H2S and duration of exposure. To help you memorize the crucial facts, just look at this table. The yellow section represents a small quantity of H2S in which you can spend limited time without a respirator. And the red part represents the dangerous quantity of H2S where you should not be without a respirator. Short-term exposure to high concentration of H2S can result in long-term consequences and deteriorate your health immediately after exposure, especially respiratory and nervous systems. 
Long-term exposure to low concentrations of H2S may have similar effects revealed over an extended period of time. Although the damage to health may not be so severe, the risk to your health is still considerable. Let's summarize this part and highlight the main points which you must remember. H2S can be detected by its smell, although the concentration higher than 100 ppm will disable your sense of smell. Even though you are allowed to work in an area which contains a low concentration of H2S, you should wear a BA set whenever any gas is detected. Reduce your exposure time as low as possible and wear a BA set whenever there's a possibility of H2S release. Now that you're familiar with the properties of H2S and how it can affect your health, you will learn how to protect yourself. There are three different types of protective measures. Engineering controls are the first one. Those should eliminate the threat and exposure to H2S. A good example is flaring, where gas is burned before it could hurt anyone. Other protective measures are administrative controls, such as workers' education and development of safe working practices. The last one, and most relevant to you, is personal protective equipment. In this case, those are gas monitors, respirators and other rescue packs which we will discuss in this training session. While your employer will take care of engineering and administrative controls, your main concern is to use your personal protective equipment. The essential piece of PPE is a gas detector that will alarm you about the presence of H2S. There are a few different types of gas detectors intended for various purposes. We will explain the three different types which you will most likely encounter on your worksite. Personal gas detector will keep you safe by constantly analyzing the air quality around you. It will sound alarm if any H2S is detected. Some models have multiple sensors to warn you about other toxic gases. Again, you should always have it with you. That is your responsibility and the most important part of your PPE. Another type is called portable gas monitor. Its purpose is to test the atmosphere before entry. It has a sensor attached to the end of the long hose, which is lowered into the area to analyze the air quality from a safe distance. We usually use it before enclosed space entry, such as tank inspections. In facilities where appropriate engineering controls are implemented, you will notice the fixed gas detectors placed in various locations. Those detectors transmit air quality data to the main control panel. In case of gas detection, the panel will inform the operator about the location and quantity of H2S. It will also sound alarm to notify all personnel about the danger. As you can see, there are different types of gas detectors which we use for different purposes. To simplify, you will carry around your personal gas detector. You will use a portable gas detector before entering enclosed space, while the fixed gas detectors will be monitoring the atmosphere in all parts of the facility. Now that we know how to detect H2S and how harmful it is, we should learn more about breathing apparatus. These enable us to breathe in the H2S contaminated atmosphere. There will be a few different types of breathing apparatus at your disposal. We will now learn more about them and the slight differences in their use and application. Emergency escape breathing device is the smaller type, distributed in all public areas. Jackups and offshore vessels which operate near all production facilities will have one in each cabin. Depending on your breathing, it will give you 10 to 15 minutes of autonomy. That should be enough to get away from danger. Self-contained breathing apparatus has a large cylinder and should provide approximately 30 minutes of autonomy. You will use it when entering an area with insufficient air quality, such as tank cleaning, rescue of H2S casualties, escape from gas release, etc. Cascade system is often found in offshore facilities, platforms, vessels, jackups and rigs. It can supply a large quantity of air for extended time, allowing many people to use it simultaneously. Breathing air is stored in cylinders supported by an air compressor, which ensures that cylinders are always fully charged. Air is then distributed from storage cylinders to the manifolds on the master station, where workers can connect their EBD and prolong their air supply. Before we continue any further, let's quickly summarize what we just learned about breathing apparatus. Emergency escape breathing device contains 10 to 15 minutes of air. We use it when we hear the alarm to escape and reach the safe area. Self-contained breathing apparatus contains approximately 30 minutes of air. We use it to enter a contaminated area or to escape. Cascade system contains a large quantity of air which can support a large number of people for extended period of time. As you can see, the critical part of every breathing apparatus is the cylinder which stores the air. 
It might be larger or smaller, but it serves the same purpose. It calls the air inside. The pressure gauge indicates the remaining quantity and warns you when the pressure is low. Air hoses connect the air supply to your face mask. You need to check those frequently because if that hose bursts under pressure, you know what happens next. The last piece of equipment is your face mask. It has an air regulator connected to air hoses mentioned before. The mask hermetically seals your face while the regulator enables you to breathe normally. Once you arrive at your workplace, you should be trained and familiarized with this equipment. A competent person should teach you and ensure you can put on the SCBA set without any assistance from others. In this module, you learned about personal protective equipment related to H2S. Gas detectors warn you about the danger and breathing apparatus allow you to breathe until you reach safety. While PPE is vital, your training and ability to use it will be decisive in H2S emergency. Unfortunately, statistics show that although most H2S victims have been trained, they still fail to follow the procedure, which caused the fatality. Don't become part of the statistics. Before you even arrive at your worksite, your employer will ensure you're familiar and trained to work in H2S environment. You'll get the necessary PPE, including gas detectors and breathing apparatus. A competent person will carry out the familiarization. He will ensure you're acquainted with the facility and teach you how to use your PPE. He will also familiarize you with the procedures. Those procedures will protect you and ensure you're doing your job correctly, in line with local and international regulations. As you can see, the employer will provide all prerequisites to keep you safe. The rest depends on your abilities, knowledge, competence, diligence and work ethics. That is why you are encouraged to take part in drills and trainings, read the manuals and procedures, and ask for guidance from your superiors. You should be aware that PPE will help you only if you take care of it and use it properly. All equipment should be periodically tested and certified by an expert. Your responsibility is to check the label and make sure it's all good before you use it. Other than periodical tests carried out by specialists, you need to visually check and perform a function test before using your PPE, such as a gas detector or breathing apparatus. The procedures mentioned earlier will help you assess the risk and do the necessary checks before entering the H2S site. These include informing others about your entry and establishing a good communication identifying potential hazards on the site and considering an approach from an upwind direction, as well as using a breathing apparatus. Regardless of risk assessment, you should be ready for the worst case scenario. Your gas detector should be on and you should be using breathing apparatus. Never enter H2S site alone. There should always be a standby person there, able to communicate with you. He should also have his own breathing apparatus and the rest of the team nearby. By now you should understand that it's your responsibility to maintain the equipment your life depends on. It must be operational and ready for use whenever you may need it. Before entering the H2S site, you should conduct a risk assessment and toolbox meeting with the others. Procedures will guide you and ensure you are doing it right. When entering, ensure your safety by all means at your disposal. Your team should be ready and able to help in case anything goes wrong. The last part of this training is about rescue and first aid. You should know what to do when your colleague is injured and needs help. Your instinct will trigger an immediate response without regard to your own safety, but you must be aware that your instinct is wrong. Such reaction will harm you, making the problem worse than it already is. Remember, your safety is your first priority. Once that is assured, then you can help the others. Many H2S victims are would-be rescuers who did not know how to conduct a rescue. Follow the rescue procedures and do it right. You will be trained on rescue operations. It is a part of the drill and training program. H2S vapors are absorbed in the victim's lungs and then act upon the brain to paralyze the breathing mechanism. Your first concern is to check if the victim is breathing and then check the pulse. Provide artificial respiration if a person is not breathing or CPR if there is no pulse. In case the patient is not breathing, you should simulate his normal breathing rate. 
If there's no pulse, CPR will be required. Remember, it is 30 compressions followed by two ventilations. This training and other videos on this channel are produced to educate the crew and all involved personnel. Feel free to use them in your training sessions.